If you look at the U.S. and financial advisors, there's 290,000 financial advisors. 212,000 of those own a capital group strategy for their clients. Invest, don't trade. Invest for the long term, i.e. when markets are challenged, don't get spooked, stay in there. Mike Gitlin has been preparing for a career in the investing world since childhood. I was really interested in the stock market. I would break out the newspaper, I would circle prices, I would follow them the next day, I would have a little piece of paper on the side that, that watched them. Now he runs Capital Group, one of the country's oldest and largest asset managers, founded in 1931 by Jonathan Bell Lovelace in Los Angeles. He was one of the first pioneers in the mutual fund industry. And that was, that was very unique back nearly 100 years ago. And he wanted to do research. So there was a lot of trading back then, but there was less research-driven investing. The firm is well known for its distinctive investment approach, what they call the capital system. Rather than individual all-star managers, the capital system employs a multi-manager structure, each responsible for a specific segment of the portfolio. You get diverse opinions, you get highest conviction. We, we like to say you're not left with one individual's 300th best idea. These days, Capital Group manages $2.7 trillion with more than 9,000 employees in 32 offices around the world. I travel a lot to see our clients and associates around the world. Um, and in some areas, we're just getting going and able to do, and able to do a lot more. So Capital Group is a firm that is so large that uh, it's hard to not know them in the money management world, but outside the money management world, it's not as well known as other firms. Why is that? You try to stay low key relative to other money management firms? Historically, we've had a pretty low profile. Uh, we try to let our investing and our investment results do the talking and, and don't really promote ourselves. More recently, we have built more in brand. If you look at the United States, for example, Broadridge would say we're a top three recognized brand in the United States. Outside the United States, we're growing our brand, but our focus has been on managing people's money and a little less on promoting capital group. You'll see more of that over time as we get our name out there, um, but it's been a humble organization. So let's talk about um, things that people often talk about today. Um, do you think the presidential election, whichever way it goes, is gonna have a big impact on the stock market or the fixed income market? If you look back over the last 20 elections, there's been two that have been negative years for the stock market, 2000 and 2008. 2000, we had the dot-com burst, and then 2008, we had the global financial crisis. Outside of that, the other 18 were actually positive years for the stock market. When FDR got elected president, if you put $1,000 into the S&P 500, today it would be worth $22 million. During that period of time, we've had eight Democratic presidents, seven Republican presidents. So market timing and uh, amidst presidential elections is not a good strategy. We like to say it's time in market, not market timing. So I know there's a lot of concern about the election, geopolitics, there's a lot of serious things happening in the world. Getting invested, staying invested is a lot better than trying to trade elections. What about the international markets? Uh, increasingly, Americans are investing around the world are you uh, sanguine about the international markets as being reasonably predictable or, or at least getting reasonably good returns? I think if you look at international markets, they've struggled relative to the U.S. for the last 15 years. In a very simple way, and for me, not for the, for the audience, the S&P has done about twice as well as the international markets over the last 15 years, about 15% annualized versus 7 or 8% annualized. If you look over the next 15 years, will that gap narrow? I think so. There's plenty of opportunities our analysts and portfolio managers are finding outside the U.S. The other way I'd answer that is the, the domicile of a company, where it's headquartered, has very little to do with its business very often. Now, as we talk, uh, we're in New York City, but your firm is based where? We're based in Los Angeles. When was the company actually started? 1931 and was started by Mr. Lovelace. Jonathan Bell Lovelace. And was he a money manager before that or he just decided to start a firm doing that? So he was and he wanted to start his own firm. 
and he was one of the first pioneers in the mutual fund industry. And that was, that was very unique back nearly 100 years ago. And he wanted to do research. So there was a lot of trading back then, but there was less research-driven investing. And he was a very bright man who wanted to do the research. And that's, I, I think, if you think of the foundation of our company, the hallmark of it, it's actually research, and he was the first one to do that. We started in 1931. Uh, I assume that Mr. Lovelace or his descendants, or his descendants' descendants, are big owners of the company now? So he had a very selfless way about him, and his son, John Lovelace, who really steered the firm for many years at Capital Group, and Rob Lovelace and Jim Lovelace are still at Capital Group. Their idea was to spread ownership. So they would, John Lovelace would walk around the hallways 50 years ago, and, or 40 years ago as well, and sell some of his stock to someone else in an office next to him, saying, I don't need to own all of this company. So it's been a very selfless way to manage a private enterprise. They really did disperse ownership to hundreds and hundreds of people as opposed to just a few. And the Lovelace family, they're shareholders now, but small shareholders of the overall enterprise. Okay, so if you're managing now $2.7 trillion, which is a lot of money, I assume Wall Street investment bankers come by every day and say, you should go public. You get an enormous value for your company. Uh, you're going to think about going public? Never. So we have very few nevers, because never's a really long time. We're never going public. And the reason I say that is the opportunity for external shareholders to come in and make our long-term ethos into their short-term needs, it's not something we would want to do. So we are able to manage a company for the long term. And that's not just a saying, that's what we do. So when there's tough times out there, a lot of folks aggressively cut costs that could impact their clients. We're able to ride those storms with a pretty strong balance sheet. Now, Capital Group is a firm that is actively managed. For those people that aren't familiar with that phrase, that means you're not in passive indexes. You're not just buying the S&P 500 index or something like that. But the theory behind passive index funds is that in the end, it's hard to beat the market, so just go into a passive fund. You obviously don't agree with that. Is that right? We've managed active assets for 93 years. So I can see why some folks would say, can active managers really beat the benchmarks? A lot can't. We have very smart folks in a good process, and we've done that over time. And we will add passive in if we're creating a solution for a client, an active passive blended solution. But we won't manage the passive ourselves. We're active managers. So on passive, the theory again was that you can't beat the market over a period of time. But if that's wrong, why doesn't everybody give you their money? And why do the passive funds do so well in terms of getting capital? Well, a lot of people do give us their money. We manage $2.7 trillion today. Some folks just want cheap beta. Some folks want very low fee and to track the benchmark. And some folks, and it's been difficult for equity managers to beat the benchmark over the last decade. So there's been, if you've owned the S&P 500 over the last 15 years, you've done very, very well. So telling that story, telling the capital advantage, there's a lot of folks who, who know it. If you look at the U.S. and financial advisors, there's 290,000 financial advisors. 212,000 of those own a capital group strategy for their clients. So a lot of folks know us and own us, but active management's had a struggle with a lot of other managers, and we recognize right. that. So if you can beat passive, uh, there must be a secret to it. Is it that you're smarter, you hire smarter people, you work harder, you have more knowledge of the industries you invest in? What is it that you have that the passive people don't have? We have the capital system. So the capital system, 1958, Jonathan Bell Lovelace, the founder of Capital Group, had a heart attack. He recovered for that, from that, but was trying to figure out how to make sure that we have succession done right, how we don't have key person risk. And the theory at the time was, let's have multiple portfolio managers participate in a given strategy and then let's add our analysts as investors. Not stock raters, not credit raters, but actual investors. So you take really smart folks, you put them together in a portfolio, you add analysts to that portfolio who show their conviction in what they own in it, not what they tell you to own in it. And that creates the capital system. And that system is collaborative, researched, 
our analysts in, for companies last year, they did 21,000 company meetings, our analysts and portfolio managers combined. You have a real edge. That's about 80 or 90 meetings per day, per work day, that our, that our analysts and portfolio managers are having with CEOs around the world. You get an advantage with that kind of culture and that kind of research process. If somebody wants to invest with Capital Group, they should get a financial manager who says you need this, that, or something else, and I can recommend somebody at Capital Group to take care of your account. If you had a million dollars and you called up a financial advisor, they would say to you, what, is, what are your long-term plans? What's your risk appetite? And they would construct the portfolio for that individual. I'm hopeful and guessing that that advisor would have capital group strategies in that investment plan. I was really interested in the stock market. I would break out the newspaper. I would circle prices. I would follow them the next day. Hey, let's talk about your own background. Um, so did you grow up in what city? So I grew up in West Hartford, Connecticut. Okay, and West Hartford, Connecticut is famous for what? Uh, well, Hartford was the insurance capital of the world back then. So was your family in the insurance business? My father, who's 82, he was a lawyer, uh, built his own law firm with a partner, and he catered and served the insurance industry and a lot of other clients as well, but that, were, that group of clients were his biggest clients. All right, so when you were growing up, what did you want to be, a money manager? Did you say, I really want to manage money for other people, or what did you want to be? So I didn't have that in mind. I was really interested in the stock market. I would break out the newspaper. I would circle prices. I would follow them the next day. I would have a little piece of paper on the side that, that watched them. Um, and I tried to teach myself investing that way. And so I didn't know I would be at Capital Group in my 50s. Uh, but I did know I was interested in the markets and the market movements. Okay, so where did you go to college? I went to Colgate University in upstate New York. And you went there because they were good in money management or you just happened I to like it? I was trying to find the coldest place in the world to go to school and upstate New York happened to be that. No, it was, it was a liberal arts education. I, I thought from an education standpoint, if I, knowing that I was interested in investing early on, I wanted to learn liberal arts. I majored in history, not accounting or economics. I wanted to learn a broad set of, of disciplines and then revert to my interest in the markets thereafter. Okay, so after you graduated, what did you decide to do? So the first year, I went to Australia. And in Australia, I worked at a private school and I coached basketball and taught history and English. And I did that for six months as a bit of a student exchange program post-college graduation. And that was just a fantastic experience. And then I returned in the early 90s to Connecticut and, and I needed a, a job. And I found a job at a very small hedge fund to work in what was known then as the back office, now the middle office in an operations role. Okay, and you did that for how long? Well, it was a relatively short period of time where the principal of, of the firm at that point brought me into his office. And I thought, God, it's so fast to get fired. I didn't even do anything yet. And he said, do you want to start trading? And I said, sure, like, why? And he said, no matter how bad you might be, you can't be doing any worse than we're doing right now in that aspect, so can you help us a bit? And I said, I can surely try. I started working overnight from Connecticut, and I was trading the Asian market, so I would come into the office at four or five in the afternoon and work till four in the morning. And I actually did that type of night trading for a total of five years. And did you specialize in fixed income or equities? At that point, it was equity. So in, in my career, I had the fortune of doing both. I spent the first 15 years doing equities and the second 15 years more focused on the bond market. Okay, so what did you do after that? So after that, I moved to New York City. I was working at what was known then as BEA Associates, which ended up being purchased by Credit Suisse. Um, and I was in New York trading overnight for several years. I moved to Singapore and traded there, the Asian markets, from the proper time zone, not as a night trader. Uh, and then I ultimately joined Citigroup. I moved from the buy side to the sell side. And I was asked by a guy named Dennis McAllister, do you want to go to Asia, live in Hong Kong, and help manage our sales and trading business in the region? And 
I came home and asked my wife that. We, I was 29 at the time, and the prospect of moving to Asia um, probably wasn't on the top of my wife's list or my list at that time, but the opportunity was just incredible, so we did it. So you moved to where? We moved to Hong Kong at that point in 1999. So how long were you there? I was in Hong Kong for four years, moved back to New York in 2003 in the sales and trading business at Citi, um, and then I went to T. Rowe Price in 2007. T. Rowe Price is a money management firm based in Baltimore, a mutual fund, and you were doing fixed income there? So I joined initially to oversee the global trading group, and then my predecessor in the fixed income group there, Mary Miller, went to work for Obama as an undersecretary of treasury. And the CEO at the time, Jim Kennedy, said, can you oversee the fixed income group? And my immediate response was, you should find someone capable to do that. And he said, we tried, but will you still do it anyhow? And so I ended up doing that. I don't think I was really qualified to do that at the time where my, the majority of my background had been equities. Um, but he said, we'd love you to do it, and I, and I had that experience in 2009. All right, so you're, doing, you're overseeing fixed income at T. Rowe Price. Um, then you're recruited to come to Capital Group, but Capital Group is largely a uh, equities organization, not a fixed income. So why would they have recruited a fixed income person? You know, at the time, Capital Group had assets that were about 85% equity and 15% fixed income. And Tim Armour, the, the CEO who came before I did, called and said, we want to be a world-class fixed income manager. We have great people, which Capital Group did have, but it hasn't been our primary focus, and we want to do that for the next generation. Income as people retire is critical. Would you come out here to California and do that for us? And um, we met for a while, and I had no intention at the time of leaving T. Rowe Price, but Capital Group has an incredibly unique culture. And having that opportunity, it's the largest equity manager with a relatively undersized fixed income business and the resources to make it great. And I said to Tim, there's a long list of things that we need to do if you really want the company to be best in class in fixed income. And I shared the list with him and he didn't line item veto. He said, let's just do it right. And so I joined Capital Group at the beginning of 2015. Okay, so you joined, and you think that you would ever be the CEO since you were a fixed income person coming into an equity shop? No. So that wasn't the, it really wasn't the intent. The intent was to have the resources work with the folks who were already at Capital Group, bring in some other folks who could help and build that business. The intent was never to be the CEO of Capital Group. And, and I should say, yes, I am the CEO of Capital Group, but we are managed by three senior partners. Jody Johnson and Martin Romo are my partners who are the senior folks. And we also have a 10-person management committee. So Capital Group's not overseen by just one person. It's much broader spread structure than just one CEO. Okay, so um, you became the CEO how long ago now? October of last year. And are you enjoying being the CEO or is it more aggravation than it's worth? <laughs> no, I, I'm enjoying it. Look, we, we have great clients. We have this business that's already large, but there's so many other things we can do for clients around the world. It's fun. It, I think if, if you're enjoying what you're doing, the stress of it, while it's still stressful, uh, isn't as overwhelming as it otherwise might be. So I, I'm, I'm enjoying it. I travel a lot to see our clients and associates around the world. Um, and in some areas, we're just getting going and able to do, and, and able to do a lot more. Invest, don't trade. Invest for the long term, i.e. when markets are challenged, don't get spooked, stay in there. Now, in the money management world or in the financial world, very often people go and get an MBA, um, Master's of Business Administration. You obviously did very well without getting one. So do you recommend that people not get an MBA or do you think people should get an MBA? I think it depends on the individual. For some folks, it's important. It's a good steer. Um, and for other folks who come out of college and want to start doing something, it might not make sense to go back. I don't, I don't have a hard and fast rule on that. I guess if I were going to 
give advice though for new folks entering the workforce, it's don't listen to folks who say, don't work that hard. There's, some, there's a mentality out there that um, have so much work-life balance that you're not sure you're working sometimes. And my, my comment is work hard enough to make sure that you're learning from people, you're becoming an expert in something. Don't plan too, too far ahead. I had no idea this is what I would do 25, 30 years ago. Don't try to plan too far ahead, but be an expert at what you do and you'll be recognized to do other things. And by the way, uh, do you actually get people to come into the office to work? Because a lot of money management firms actually can't get their people to come back to work, uh, or they beg them to come back for three days a week physically in the office. What is your pattern? Our investment professionals have four days a week in the office. They travel together a lot. This culture is a collaborative one. You have to work together in person. It's, it's not always popular when I say that, Working together in person is so important and our investment folks want to be together, they want to travel together, and they're doing four days a week. What is the best investment advice you've ever had and what investment advice would you give to others? Invest, don't trade. Invest for the long term, i.e. when markets are challenged, don't get spooked, stay in there. If you're not a professional, have someone professionally manage your money. Don't get in, involved in investment hobbies, as I like to say. Investment hobbies are generally not profitable. So get inv invested early, stay invested through all periods, regardless of where the market is at that point, and ask someone to do it who does it for a living. I, I, I wouldn't be good as a dentist for you, and a lot of folks aren't great at managing their own money. Get a financial advisor and have them help you out. What's the most common mistake that investors make? I think individual investors, it's not getting invested early enough in their lives so it can compound over time or trading as opposed to investing. And for professional investors, it's short-termism. It really is. It's, it's trying to be too smart on every quarterly earnings report. That's not great long-term investing. And so it, it is trying to be too smart and, and too tactical in how they invest, as opposed to looking out five years and 10 years and, and taking advantage of that opportunity to invest in the long-term. So how old are you now? 53. 53, that's well, a teenager compared to me. But, um, <laughs> so how long is there a requirement that you stay for a certain period of time or a retire requirement that you leave at a certain period of time at Capital Group? For management committee members only, the 10 members of management committee uh, must step off management committee at 63. That's 10 years for me. Um, in reality, we're working on our long-term strategic plan right now. Our centennial is in 2031, and our long-term strategic plan is 2031 mindset. Uh, I think the senior leaders will do our very best to deliver that long-term strategic plan with the entire enterprise, and that's probably a good time for someone else to write the next chapter.